I'd like to thank you for beginning your day with us. Our guest today is Gordon Chang. As an astute Asian watcher, Gordon will provide insight on a topic we've been hearing a lot about. And yes, you guessed it, it's Trump, North Korea, and China. For many years, Gordon has been writing and speaking about Asia. Early on, he recognized that Kim's nuclear ambitions extended far beyond the possession of a few weapons, and that North Korea's missile program would soon present an existential threat to not only our Asian allies, but to ourselves. He wrote about this in his book, Nuclear Showdown, North Korea Takes on the World, which was published more than a decade ago. For America, the combination of North Korea's quest to be a global nuclear power and the role China could play in halting that ambition appears, at least at the moment, to be one of the top foreign policy priorities for this administration. However, there is one problem. No one seems to be quite sure where the president stands on the most dangerous international issue of the day. Not so long ago, Trump warned North Korea to prepare for fire and fury, while just last week when addressing South Korea's National Assembly, we heard a more temperate Trump saying that diplomacy could work, albeit with conditions. Then on his visit to China, he asked the Chinese to confront North Korea, saying that the longer we wait, the greater the danger grows. The resulting confusion would be difficult under any circumstances, but when there is a possibility for a military conflict, one with catastrophic consequences, deft diplomacy is required. This posturing is particularly worrisome. The question is whether there is a morally desirable outcome. Is there a middle ground between capitulation and war, a willingness to negotiate, to come to the table and quote unquote make a deal? Or as they say in Washington, is North Korea just the land of bad options? For more on this, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our guest right off the set of Morning Joe, Gordon Chang. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Joanne. With distressing frequency, the fiery leaders of the United States of America and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea tell us, make it sound as if we are just moments away from history's next great conflict. And unfortunately, Donald John Trump and Kim Jong-un may be right. Because there's so much war talk, there's too much news. And because there's too much news, we all need a framework for understanding developments. So today, I'll give you my explanation of how we got into this dreadful situation and how we can extricate ourselves, our friends, and allies. And so as to not leave you in suspense, I'm going to summarize what I'm going to say. If you can take home only two thoughts this morning, let it be these. The United States has overwhelming leverage over China, and China has overwhelming leverage over North Korea. Now, these two points lead to one conclusion, and that is we can, without the use of force, disarm North Korea. Oh, one more thing. I know that you are the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs, but let me rename you this morning as the Carnegie Council for Morality in International Affairs. And with regard to morality, I believe that the United States has a moral obligation to exhaust all non-military options before we strike North Korea. So let's get started. First of all, how in the world are we finding ourselves where we are today? Well, the answer is distressingly simple. Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, over the course of three decades have pursued misguided policies. And our policies have been misguided for many reasons, but one of them is that is they were based on fundamentally incorrect assumptions. And this morning, I'm going to talk about four of those incorrect assumptions. So first of all, we've all heard that people say, the Kim regime, they only want security. And there's a variant of that. We have been told that the Kims have watched American presidents overthrow Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi and thought, oh, all the Kims want is a deterrent to preserve their own regime. Unfortunately, though, 
the North Koreans for decades have had a deterrent. That's the ability to destroy Seoul, a metropolitan area of 26 million people, with nothing more uh, interesting than chemical and biological agents and high explosives. Yet the North Koreans have been pursuing nuclear weapons for decades. In 1965, Kim Il-sung, the regime founder, talked to Mao Zedong, the founder of the People's Republic of China, and asked him for China's plans for their nu nuclear device. And the Chinese exploded their first one in 1964. And indeed, there are some indications that the North Koreans have had a bomb program since the end of the Korean War, July 1953. So we should not be surprised that the world's most militaristic regime wants the world's most fearsome weapons. Core goal of the Kim family is to take over South Korea. Indeed, extending the rule of the Kim family to the south is the key to the survival of the North Korean regime. The Korean Peninsula, after all, is the world's most interesting political experiment. You got one Korea chock full of rich Koreans, and right next to it, you have another Korea full of poor ones. The people in the poor Korea, of course, are willing to accept their destitution, but only if they think they are sacrificing for a goal. And that goal, the Kim family tells them, is the removal of foreign troops from the Korean Peninsula, as well as the extension of Kim's Juche system to the entire Korean nation. Kim Jong-un, the ruler of North Korea, he needs to show progress in this goal. And that makes the situation in North Asia inherently unstable. As soon as Kim feels confident in his arsenal, which I think could be somewhere between 9 and 15 months from now, I believe that he will use the prospect of the incineration of American cities to blackmail the United States to break its mutual defense treaty with South Korea, then get our 28,500 service personnel off the peninsula so that he can then intimidate South Korea into submission. To us, this plan sounds outlandish. But we got to remember that there's a guy named Trump who March of last year during the campaign said maybe the United States should walk away from its mutual defense commitments to both the Japanese and the South Koreans. And indeed, Kim Jong-un in recent months has been talking more and more about quote-unquote final victory, North Korean code for taking over the South. So at least Kim is not giving us the impression that he thinks that this goal cannot be accomplished. In short, we are just not responsible for Kim's nuclear weapons programs. And in short, Kim Jong-un harbors dangerous ambitions. Let's look at the second incorrect assumption, that the North Koreans know better than to take us on, that we can, therefore, maintain deterrence. Kim family, unfortunately, does not see us as particularly intimidating. After the end of the Korean War, Kim rulers have gotten the better of the US and South Korea at almost every turn. Kim Jong-un may remember that his grandfather, Kim Il-sung, grabbed the Pueblo an unarmed Navy reconnaissance vessel from international water. He held the crew for almost a year. He killed one of them. And what happened? He got an apology from the Johnson administration. The year after that, 1969, Kim shot down an unarmed Navy EC-121 in international airspace, killing all 31 crew. The largest single loss of life for America during the Cold War at the hands of a Cold War adversary. 1976, Kim's attacked two US Army officers in the demilitarized zone, hacked them to death. In none of these instances did the United States impose any costs on the North Koreans. And indeed, the South Koreans do not look especially intimidating either. In addition to all the South Koreans that Kim Il-sung killed in the 1980s, and there are quite a lot of them, the, South, the North Koreans sunk the Chonan, a South Korean frigate, in March of 2010. 46 sailors killed. And then, in that same year, in November, they shelled Yongpin Island, killing four, two of them civilians. Although many people here say Kim Jong-un is irrational, quote-unquote, maybe, 
but it wouldn't be crazy for him to think that he could kill more Americans and get away with it. Now, we know that we would retaliate, but Kim himself has many reasons to believe that we would not. Consequently, there could be this mismatch in perceptions, and whenever there's a mismatch in perceptions, there can be a failure of deterrence. We can deter stable states. We know that. After all, we deterred the Soviet Union for decades. We are deterring China now. But the question is, can we deter a state that looks precarious all the time and may now be on the edge of failure? Here's the third incorrect assumption, that North Korea's threat to the American homeland was always going to be just over the horizon, that it would be a long time before they could threaten us with their nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. And despite all the proven capabilities of the Kim regime, many are downplaying the threat now, talking as if the Kimster can't put a nuke on top of the three missiles that he has that can reach the American homeland, that his heat shielding doesn't work, that his guidance systems are lousy. By now, we can see, we can certainly assume, that he is making fast progress, not only improving his weapons, but also integrating all of his capabilities. And the least likely explanation for all of this is that the North Koreans have been doing this on their own. That brings us to the fourth assumption, that China wants to disarm North Korea. We want the Chinese to help us disarm North Korea. It's in China's interest to disarm North Korea. But unfortunately, there are disturbing implications that the Chinese are, in fact, arming their neighbor. On April 15th, we witnessed a very large canister paraded through the center of Pyongyang during the Kim Il-sung parade. That canister was Chinese in origin, from what we can tell, and it's the canister that the Chinese use to carry their DF-41 missile. A DF-41 has a range of at least 8,700 miles, putting all of the American homeland in a range. Now this, of course, is not to say conclusively that the Chinese gave the North Koreans the DF-41. After all, the North Koreans could have paraded an empty canister. The, Chinese, the North Koreans could have stolen the plans from the Chinese. Or the North Koreans could have gotten the plans for the missile from a country to which China proliferated the missile, perhaps Pakistan. But the parading of this ominous looking canister should lead the administration in Washington to start asking Beijing some pointed questions. And while they're at it, the international community should ask China where North Korea got the missile that it successfully tested on May 21. The, test, the missile tested on May 21 is the same that they tested February 12th. Both of those are land-based missiles. The February 12th missile looks to be a variant of the missile that the North Koreans tested on August 24th from below the surface of the Sea of Japan. And the missile that the North Koreans tested on August 24th, that looks an awful lot like China's JL-1 submarine launched missile. Are you noticing a pattern that missiles that look like they're Chinese are mysteriously showing up in North Korea's inventory? And there's some more bad news. The canister we saw on April 15th, it was being paraded through the heart of the North Korean capital on a Chinese vehicle. The 16-wheel vehicle, we know where it came from. It was manufactured by Sanjong Special Vehicle Corporation, which is a unit of China Aerospace Science and Industry Corp. CASIC, as China Aerospace is known, is closely connected with China's People's Liberation Army. Moreover, that enterprise also transferred the chassis for the transporter erector launcher that the North Koreans used for their KN-08, a three-stage missile. We know that because Beijing admitted it in 2012. The New York Times reports that Chinese officials told their American counterparts that they sold the chassis to the North Koreans because the North Koreans said they wanted the chassis for logging vehicles. Now, that explanation doesn't make sense on many levels, but one thing we can point out is that those chassis are wider than the roads in North Korea's logging areas. And indeed, 
American intelligence officials will privately tell you that the story is worse than what the New York Times said. Intelligence officials will tell you that the Obama administration talked to the Chinese before the sale of the chassis, and Beijing went ahead anyway. My sense, I can't prove it, but my sense is that the Chinese not only sold the chassis for these transporter erector launchers, but they also sold the rest of the vehicle. In other words, the missile interface. And supplying the vehicle is critical because it makes North Korea a real threat to the American homeland. We are not concerned about North Korea's longest range missile being used as a weapon. That's the Taipodong 2 or the Taipodong 3, depending who you talk to. The Taipodongs take weeks to transport, to assemble, to fuel and test. We can kill them on the pad. But these other missiles are real threats because they're mobile. Because they're mobile, they can hide. Because they can hide, we cannot, with any assurance, kill them before they are launched at us. And the intercontinental ballistic missiles that North Korea tested on July 4th and July 28th, they rode to their launch sites on Chinese vehicles as well. China, we have to conclude, is weaponizing it in North Korea, giving it the capability to kill Americans by the tens of millions. And by the way, just for completing the conversation, the Chinese have also been supplying components, equipment, and materials for North Korea's nuclear weapons program. The flow of materials from China to North Korea has occurred over the course of decades and cannot be anything other than a result of conscious policy in Beijing. Now, due in part to our wrong assumptions, we are reaching an exceedingly dangerous period. And last month, President Trump said, this is, quote, the calm before the storm. So what can we do in this period of relative calm to prevent that storm? Well, the Chinese, as we've just discussed, armed Kim, so they can disarm him. Chinese diplomats love to tell us that he who has tied the knot shall untie it. China has tied this particular knot, so China should untie it. Despite their repeated claims that Beijing has no leverage over the North Koreans, as I mentioned, Chinese leverage over Kim is overwhelming. Now, because the Chinese tell us that they're good Marxists, let's start with economics. So, for instance, last year, China accounted for over 92% of North Korea's two-way trade. China provides more than 90% of North Korea's requirements for crude oil, much of it on concessionary terms. China supplies somewhere between 35 and 45% of North Korea's food. That's particularly important this year because the drought has been the worst since 2001. There are some years when China supplies 100% of North Korea's requirements for aviation fuel. China, as we all know, is North Korea's primary backer in diplomatic councils, such as the UN. As they say, the Kim regime could neither bark nor bite without North Korea, without China. And clearly, without China, there is no North Korea. China supplies many things to the North Koreans, but the most important is confidence. Confidence in, this, in the minds of senior regime members in Pyongyang that they are safe. Safe from the United States, safe from South Korea, safe from the international community. I don't know if Beijing could change Kim Jong-un's mind. Maybe nobody could do that, but that doesn't matter. What China can do is change the minds of senior regime elements that it is no longer in their interest to support Kim's weapons programs or even to support Kim himself, who, because of all the execution and purges, is increasingly unpopular in the North Korean capital. Now, many observers, especially Chinese ones, argue that Kim Jong-un's defiance of Beijing proves that China has no influence in the North Korean capital. Yeah, relations between Beijing and Pyongyang are icy, and there's no doubt Kim Jong-un is deeply unhappy with the Chinese, but that does not mean that Beijing is not in charge. Chinese officials do not expect obedience all the time. Beijing supports the North Koreans, whether they are compliant or not, because the Chinese feel that, at least over the long term, 
the North Koreans will know their place. The Chinese know they have influence, they just choose not to exercise it all the time. But when China really wants something, it pulls the string. The Chinese work hard in trying to convince us that they don't have leverage, but they don't protest too much. And in fact, if the Chinese had no leverage, then it's suspicious that the North Koreans, who this year have been launching missiles at the pace of once every two weeks, stopped doing so on September 15th. In other words, in the run-up to the Communist Party's 19th National Congress, the most sensitive time in the Chinese political calendar. This is the time that Xi Jinping demanded calm so that there, nothing would disrupt his relentless drive to consolidate his position in China. Also, after the conclusion of the Congress last month, Kim Jong-un sent a warm message to Xi Jinping. That certainly undercuts the narrative that there are terrible relations between the leaders of these two states. And when Kim does something like that, a lot of people were surprised, but nonetheless, it is an indication of the true nature of the relations. All is built on trade violation after trade violation, and that makes Beijing particularly vulnerable to the penalties that the Trump administration could levy, such as tariffs that would might follow the Section 301 investigation into China's theft of American intellectual property. Now, many people say, oh, you know, we can't pressure China because that would just cause a trade war. Well, there are a lot of things that can, people can say about Donald Trump, but the one thing you can't say is that he can start a trade war with China. We're already in a trade war. It's only the Chinese who are waging it, and we are completely oblivious. In any event, even if the Chinese retaliated, so what? There are a lot of reasons why we don't have to care. First of all, last year we ran a goods and services trade deficit with China of $309.3 billion. Trade deficit countries don't worry about trade friction. And we owe Americans out of everybody in the world should know that. Because in the Great Depression and the trade friction, who got hurt the most? The world's trade surplus country, the United States. Second, the US does not have an economy geared to selling things to China. But China has an economy geared to selling things to us. Third, for all the faults of the American economy, and let me tell you, there are many, despite the 3.0% growth for the third quarter, despite all the problems in the American economy, our economy is stable. China's, on the other hand, is proceeding slowly but surely to a systemic debt crisis perhaps the worst in world history. And fourth, we can just push the Chinese around. Last year, our economy produced $18.57 trillion of gross domestic product. China's, in comparison, produced $11.39 trillion. That number came from Beijing, and it's almost certainly exaggerated. China claimed a, gross, a, a growth rate last year of 6.7%, but the World Bank about a month ago I'm sure they did this inadvertently, but they released a chart that showed that in 2016, the Chinese economy grew by 1.2%. Bigger combatants always have the advantage in trade wars, especially when the gap is this large. U.S., in short, we hold the high cards. And by the way, China is vulnerable for another reason. Chinese banks have been laundering money for the North Koreans. And by doing so, they've been violating federal law. The Treasury Department on June 29th designated Bank of Dundong, a small fry Chinese company, as a primary money laundering concern under Section 311 of the Patriot Act. That meant Bank of Dundong could no longer do business in dollars. That's the world's dominant currency. In the last general survey of currency usage in the world, which was conducted a couple years ago by Standard & Poor's, the greenback accounted for 51.9% of the world's transactions. Of course, Bank of Dundong is just a small fry, but we know there are other culprits, such as the Bank of China, one of China's big four institutions. This financial institution was named 
in a UN report last year for devising and operating a money laundering scheme for the North Koreans in Singapore. And it's clear that Bank of China has been involved in this dirty business in other places. But as big as Bank of China is, and it's the world's fourth largest institution as measured by assets, it is probably not the largest Chinese bank that has been money laundering for the Kim regime. That honor probably goes to the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, China's largest bank. If Trump were to enforce US law, and declare one of these big banks a primary money laundering concern, it would essentially be a death sentence for that institution, and it might be a death sentence for the Communist Party itself. Got to follow the logic. If we designate Bank of China as a primary money launderer, that would mean that it would be mortally wounded. We mortally wound Bank of China. That puts the Chinese financial and banking systems, destabilizes them especially if we designate other large Chinese banks for also in being involved in money laundering. We destabilize the Chinese financial and banking systems. We, pu we push the Chinese economy close to the edge of the cliff. Communist Party can't be too far behind. Designating Bank of China, by the way, is not something that Trump needs permission to do. For instance, he does not need to go to the UN Security Council to get this done. Now, of course, nobody wants to put Bank of China down. But on the other hand, we cannot allow anyone to use the US financial system to commit crimes. And of course, we cannot allow China to help the North Koreans become a real threat to the United States. At the end of September, President Trump thanked Xi Jinping for getting the Chinese banks out of the money laundering business with regard to the North Koreans. On the day after that, we don't know what happened because the foreign ministry in Beijing said that Trump's statements were fake news, that China actually didn't do that. Now, it's not entirely clear what occurred here, but in any event, in the past, when Chinese banks have cut their relationships with North Korean customers, they've gone back to doing business with them when the international community wasn't paying attention. So it's imperative, therefore, that Washington pay attention to what the Chinese banks and the North Koreans. Well, of course, that gives Trump a hammer over those banks and the Chinese political system, because at the stroke of the pen, he can probably put Xi Jinping, that arrogant, very proudful Chinese leader, out of business. So that gives Trump all the aces in the deck. Now, for decades, American administrations have not enforced American laws including these money laundering statutes against the Chinese for fear of angering the Communist Party. And because of that, the Chinese have taken advantage of that laxity. But that has to stop because we cannot allow any country, friend or foe, to do this. And that is why President Trump's September 21 executive order, which tells the world, if you do business with the North Koreans, you're not doing business with the United States, that's why the September 21 executive order is so important. It is a big step forward. Now, many people say that this rule is so sweeping that the president will never enforce it. I say he's got to do everything in his power to enforce it. Now, I can't say, despite all that I've argued, I can't say 100% that we can disarm North Korea peacefully. But I can say that if we do want to disarm North Korea, we have a moral obligation to do so with only non-military means until we exhaust all of them. Because I believe that we do have the power to accomplish this important goal without the use of our military. Let me also say that right now in Washington, you have American officials talking war. They are talking not just of preemptive war, which is war to stop an imminent threat, they are also talking about preventative war, a war to prevent an adversary from getting a capability to strike the United States. And that gives me the impression that the mentality in Washington now says that it is easier to go to war than to impose costs on North Korea's backers. Now, there are times in history when what is necessary, such as imposing costs on China, there are times when what is necessary is not considered practical. And those times are always followed by uncertainty, turbulence, and death in great numbers. And I fear that we are at one of those fateful moments. Thank you.
you lay the foundation for a very provocative thought discussion. So I ask that if you have a question, please raise your hand and introduce yourself. And uh, Christian, we'll start over here. And we'll go around this table. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm the ambassador of Liechtenstein to the UN. Um, thanks for a great presentation. Just, just one question, really. Um, from what we've seen at the UN, you know, the statement that the US has overwhelming leverage over China is really not backed up by what we have seen in the Security Council. And beyond, actually, we see quite the opposite, that the US keeps uh, pushing and asking for things and ends up with results that are far, far beyond what they ask for. How do you, how do you explain that discrepancy? Or how, how is it that, especially this president, this administration who has used this rhetoric before the elections, after the elections, vis-a-vis -vis China, does not use the leverage that he said it has. What's the explanation for that? That's a great question, and that goes to the core of the problem of American diplomacy, because I believe that American presidents have not used all the elements of national power to protect the American people, and I think history is going to judge some American presidents pr pretty poorly for that. You've got to remember that there's a corresponding period. That was the 1970s, when the United States was in that state of... Um, as Jimmy Carter said it, um, malaise. And everyone was saying um, that we had to live with the Soviet Union. It was a given that we had to have detente. That was the thought of Richard Nixon and his Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger. That was what Americans assumed, that there was nothing we could do about it. So what happened? You have a president called Ronald Reagan who says, no, 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 the Soviet Union is not a given. And what he does is he goes about undermining the Soviet Union. And as we all know, that a uh, year after he left office, Soviet Union falls apart. So yeah, the United States does not want to use its power. I understand that. And indeed, many people in this town and in Washington think we don't have that power. But you start to look at the underlying objective, uh, underlying factors and it becomes inescapable that we have much more power than we think. The one thing we don't have is we don't have political will. But I understand the way you look at the United States, the way it interacts in the UN, yeah, we think we're weak. But in fact, we are not. And as I said, I think history is going to judge some American presidents very poorly, not only with regard to North Korea, but with other uh, issues as well, for not using those elements of American power because of their perceptions. The other thing is, and, and this is a little, bit, um, a little bit different, in the sense that since Nixon, um, it has been a primary objective of American foreign policy to integrate China into the international system. And because that was our objective, we tolerated a lot of behavior that we would not have tolerated from other nations. Uh, and so the Chinese took advantage of that and the Chinese made themselves look pretty powerful. Um, President Trump, however, has said, oh no, integrating the Chinese into the international system, that's not on my to-do list. His to-do list is to disarm North Korea. Now, we can all disagree with what President Trump says, the insults that he hurls to North Korea, all the rest of it. But the one thing that he does get, should get credit for is that he has said, I'm going to protect Americans from North Korea. I'm going to make it the primary objective of my foreign policy. And indeed, if you, you know, a lot of people say, well, Trump's attitudes towards China is inconsistent. No, it actually isn't. For decades, Americans have had a China policy. Trump, in reality, doesn't have a China policy. He has policies that affect China, but they're not China policies. He has a North Korea policy. And when he thinks that China is helping on North Korea, He's been very easy on the Chinese. But you go and look at that June 20 tweet where he expresses disappointment in Xi Jinping, you see the change in American policy um, with regard to China. And that's because he decided that Xi Jinping was foot dragging. So this is a very different president, a very different foreign policy. He's thrown out a lot of the accepted truths. And we can say it's a good thing or a bad thing. But the point is, there's a new sheriff in town. Thank you very much. WPS Sidhu from uh, NYU. Uh, thank you for a uh, brilliant presentation there. Um, 
China probably has more influence in North Korea than it says, but probably less than what a lot of others uh, assume. Uh, but that being said, uh, I, I, I think the key question still remains, what is the end game for us in the US vis-a-vis -vis North Korea and indeed China? Uh, you gave the excellent example of the Soviet Union. Uh, is that also the end goal for China and North Korea? What exactly do we want vis-a-vis -vis North Korea to disappear or just be unarmed? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, if, in the United States, policymakers will disagree um, violently on what the end game is. Trump administration has been pretty clear. Um, and I don't necessarily agree with them, but the Trump administration just says, look, if you disarm, everything's copacetic. Because we've had a number of statements from senior administration officials saying, we do not seek regime change. That has been a constant theme, and it's actually been said in almost the same words by Secretary Tillerson, by, for instance, UN Ambassador Haley, and, and others. So I guess that's, that's US policy. Um, take away the missiles, take away the nukes, we're all fine with you. Um, now, a lot of people say, um, and I believe that they're probably right, that you're not gonna have a disarmed North Korea unless you do have a change in the regime. And that change in the regime doesn't have to be a drastic one. It probably just has to be the elimination of Kim Jong-un. Um, now, people can disagree, and there's, that's, a, that's a two hour conversation at minimum um, about whether the North Koreans can be disarmed with Kim at the top. But um, at least American policy may be too simplistic, but the way they say it is very clear. Give up your weapons, no regime change. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a terrific presentation. I want to draw you out a little bit more on what you think is happening with China's economy and its implications. You know, I had the privilege of talking with you here at the table before the meeting began. So my impression of what the international press has to say is that China is doing quite well, that uh, China is leading the TPP countries, the United States is withdrawing, has withdrawn. Uh, Africa, where I've been teaching about Africa, is heavily involved, heavily dependent on China's economy to bolster Africa's economy. So you spoke here about an imminent debt crisis. Uh, on the horizon, and as I got it, almost irreversible. You can clarify that. So what, what is your perception of China's three to five year economic policy, and what are the implications <coughs> for all the different countries that are relying on China's economic investments, particularly in Africa, to do well? Are they heading for a disaster also? Joanne, how many uh, days do I have to answer that question? That's <laughs> um, a great question, um, and um, uh, that reminds me, my wife told me I should tell the audience, if you want to ask more than just North Korea, go for it. Um, I think that the Chinese economy is the most important topic in the world today, because as the Chinese economy goes, so goes the Chinese political system. As goes the Chinese political system, you see uh, changes in China's external policies. So this is the straw that stirs the drink um, for those people who remember Reggie Jackson, famous quote. Um, I'm probably the wrong person to talk about this because in 2001, I wrote a book called The Coming Collapse of China in which I said that the Communist Party would fall from power within 10 years. So that puts me in the middle of 2011. I am totally wrong. Um, but that doesn't deter me from actually trying to answer the question. I think the most important thing is um, China has accumulated, basically been growing. Um, and, and I think the best way to illustrate this is, let's look at the growth rates for China over the last uh, seven quarter. 6.7% um, first quarter of 2016, 6.7% second quarter, 6.7% third quarter. The Chinese want to end the year on a high note, so they report 
First quarter, 2017, 6 9, 6 9, 6 8. This is, this is stupid. I mean, this is, <laughs> even mature economies show more variation in growth rates than China, which is a developing economy which should be volatile. The problem is China is not so much growth, but it is the accumulation of debt. 2016 saw um, an unprecedented amount of debt being created at an unprecedented pace. So for instance, um, there are reports that show that China's shadow banking debt, which is really the most dangerous debt, increased something like 240% in 2016 alone. Zhou Shaochuan, who is the respected governor of the People's Bank of China, in other words, the central bank, last month said, first, in addition, he talked about China having a Minsky moment, which is startling when you have a central bank governor talking about the collapse of asset values in your country. But when Zhou Shaochuan said that, he also said something else, and that was that China's off-balance sheet debt was 257 trillion yuan. Divide by 6.4 and you get, um, and I haven't done this recently, so it's something like 38.4 trillion dollars. That's just one portion of the ratio north of 400. You know, everyone thought that George Soros was exaggerating, you know, at Davos last year when he said, oh, China has a 350% uh, 350% GDP to debt ratio. No, he probably wasn't. He probably was under, um, uh, um, underestimating. But the real issue here is, what do the Chinese people think about this? In 2015, China had a net capital outflow of $1.0 uh, $1. trillion, according to Bloomberg. We don't have good numbers for last year, but it's probably about $1.1 trillion. This year, Net capital outflow will be much less, but only because China has sort of taken the Latin American banana republic tactics and have restricted capital outflows, plus doing this not only on the books, but off the books. And because China's been doing that, people have decided not to put money into China. So last year, foreign direct investment, for the first time in my memory, fell on a dollar basis. And for the first seven months, it was down as well. So. This is a real indication. Follow the money flows. So you don't have to take it from me who's been wrong, but look at what's happening. It's just inconceivable. I, to me, I think the Chinese, because they control state banks, they control state enterprises, they control the markets. As a matter of fact, there's more control than there's ever been uh, since the end of the 19th. So, well, there's, they're, they're reversing and they're going back to more control. All of this suggests that Yes, they can defer the application of the laws of economics. They can prevent a crisis, as they prevented a crisis since 2008. But as they do that, the underlying imbalances in China have become bigger, which makes it more difficult for them to solve their problems. And they have yet, for all their power, they have yet to be able to repeal the laws of economics. So it's coming. I'm wrong on timing, but it's coming. And when it comes, it's going to take all of us by surprise but it's gonna change almost every geopolitical issue that we now think about, including, of course, North Korea. And what about Africa? Yeah. Oh, about Africa. Um, another question for David. Another, yeah. The Chinese don't like the spot market, so what they do is they go in and they overpay for minerals and oil and all the rest of it. Um, great to do that um, when commodity prices rise. It's not such a smart tactic when commodity prices fall. And I think the Chinese are, as we've seen already, at various times have been dumping commodities on global markets. Um, and I think that essentially Africa is in for problems because the Chinese are not gonna require all of the, you know, the zinc, the magnesium, the iron ore, the oil, and all the rest of it. And indeed, you know, we have seen um, problems in certain uh, resource-rich economies that have been selling to China. Because the manufacturing sector is, you know, for various times has been slow growth. Right now it's fast growth, but only because Beijing has poured on that debt, as I mentioned last year. So yeah, their manufacturing is doing well. But of course, there is no good end to that story. Hi, I'm David Pruden. I'm a master's student at Columbia University. So you're a real expert, <laughs> <laughs> unlike me. Right. 
So for the past five to six years, Kim Jong-un has had more missile launch tests than right. both Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il combined. Yeah. So what changed? What is the incentive structure for Kim Jong-un that is different from his predecessors? And also as a side note, Kim Jong-un went to boarding school in Switzerland. He speaks German, he speaks English in addition to Korean. So I'm just curious what your take is on him as a person. I know we don't know a lot about him, but his psychology and his background. Let me do the easier question first. Um, as a person, it doesn't really matter. And the reason is, North Korean regime has a certain logic to it, certain constraints. You can take anybody, um, and you, they're, gonna pray, do, they're gonna probably do the same thing, or at least try to do the same thing, because if you don't do that, you're gonna get killed, or you're gonna get sidelined, or something really nasty is gonna happen to you. So it's the logic of the regime. So yeah, Kim Jong-un could be a flaming liberal, flaming Democrat. Um, he could be the Pope. But you put him in that regime, um, he has to fight to survive because it is a snake pit. Being the dictator of North Korea is a really difficult job. Um, and it's because it's a balancing act. Um, it's got components. It's got the Korean People's Army, the military, got the Korean Workers' Party, the security services, and Kim family members. And he's got to keep all of those elements in balance. And if they're not in balance, things go really bad. Um, and one of the reasons why there have been so many executions is because Kim, when he came in, decided to change the balance of the regime as he inherited from his father. His father had a military first policy, so the military got everything. And what Kim, the younger Kim, current Kim, um, has decided to do was to uh, take money away from the flag officers and give it to the party members, which is sort of a dangerous exercise if you think about it, because they're the guys with the guns. Um, but he's been able to do that successfully, but he's killed a lot of people, at least 150, 160 senior regime officials. When you add in the juniors, those people we don't see because they go to the camps, that's maybe another three, 400 people who have been put to death. So this has been pretty bloody. It's a very difficult thing. And so, as I said, it doesn't matter who you are, you are going to have to act in a certain way um, because that's just the way the regime. Kim Il-sung built an incredibly complex, fascinating, unique regime. And basically the business of the Kim family since then has been, able to, main, has been to maintain it. As the reason why um, there's an accelerated pace of missile testing, I don't know. I mean, maybe because they can do it. Maybe because Beijing wants them to do it. Remember, you've got a deal in, 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 in Beijing where you've got the most hostile elements are actually running the show these days. Um, the North Korean military has really good links with their Chinese counterparts, despite the diplomats might have problems with each other on any particular day, and most of the time do. The military has pretty good links with each other. Um, and you have Xi Jinping, who um, doesn't like the United States, who basically identifies us is his primary strategic adversary. So it could be as something as simple as the Chinese saying, go for it, we'll protect you. But I don't know. Um, and this is one of those things that we won't know until the Kim regime falls and we get to look at the archives. possible resolve of the United States government, Trump, pushing back on China stealing our intellectual property rights and the transfer of large corporations, whether Apple, Intel, Qualcomm, to not transfer our intelligence based on China wanting to be 2030, et cetera? Yeah, a great question. Um, Robert Lighthizer, the U.S. Trade Representative, in August, I believe, started that Section 301 investigation that I mentioned. That is into um, China's theft of intellectual property. And they define it as um, not only just theft, but also um, forced transfers, where American companies are forced to transfer technology in order to gain market access, despite China's WTO, World Trade Organization, rules. There has not been a resolve to counter it. I don't work in the Trump administration. 
They don't talk to me. I don't talk to them. Um, I don't know what Lighthouse is going to do. I mean, I don't. But when you start a 301 investigation, um, it has the capacity, it has the cap uh, the Trump administration has the capacity to impose, let's say, across the board tariffs, which is what, for instance, the Blair Huntsman Commission of May 2015, I think, recommended as a last ditch measure, which is probably where they're going to go across the board tariffs. But, you know, I don't know how serious they are. Because, you know, one of these things is, as I said, um, Trump, despite what he ran on during the campaign, has made it very clear that if Beijing helps him on North Korea, they're going to get a free pass on trade. We saw this when Wilbur Ross announced the preliminary results of that 100-day action plan. You remember in Mar-a-Lago when Xi Jinping goes to Florida, meets with Trump, they announce a 100-day action plan on trade. Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, mentions like 45 days out this, this sort of uh, preliminary results. And, and Ross says, oh, this is going to help us reduce our trade deficit with China. You look at the elements of what Ross announced, they actually probably increase our trade deficit with China. And that's because Trump was saying, look, the Chinese are helping us. Now, you get to June 20 in that tweet, things change. Right after that June 20 tweet, you have all sorts of things the Trump administration does to make life really miserable for the Chinese. So, for instance, you have that warm welcome for Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. If you remember that, three bear hugs. You had the June 29th designation of Bank of Dundong, as I mentioned. China gets dropped to the worst category in the State Department's annual trafficking in persons report. The Trump administration uh, announces the arms sale, intention to sell arms to Taiwan. Um, all those things occur within a week, actually six days. Oh, also, and, Chi and America's first freedom of navigation operation against the Chinese in the Trump administration. All occur within eight days, I believe. So this is a president who has, I said, no China policy. And he has a North Korea policy. And so the question is, if you can tell me how Trump feels about North Korea at the time that um, Lighthizer is finished with his 301, then you know what it's going to happen. It's either going to be nice or it's going to be no naughty. But it's really going to be dependent on, I think, how he feels on North Korea. There is one joker in the pack, and that is that there's a guy named Steve Bannon who has publicly talked about making China an issue in every race in the midterms in 2018. I would imagine that there's, that's going to have an effect on the way Trump views how he's going to deal with China on these trade issues. Because it's not only the 301, there's also the Section 232 investigation into aluminum, which has still been deferred. And you've got a number of other things, which I won't bore everyone here with. But nonetheless, there's a big backload of trade actions that the Trump administration could dump on China. And as I think, as I said, we just wait and see. Morning, Gordon. Uh, Richard Valcourt, International a Journal of Intelligence. Uh, a couple of questions. For many years, with uh, Deng Xiaoping's ascension to power, we heard that the Communist Party didn't matter anymore in China. And yet, we see with Xi Jinping's uh, consolidation of power that the Communist Party still matters. So number one is, what, to what extent does ideology, or at least the organization of the Communist Party, matter in your view in China? Second is regarding Trump's policy regarding China, to what extent is American business or even the financial community uh, having some kind of impact on whether or not we get pretty tight with China in terms of imposing sanctions or the like? Okay, two terrific questions. Um, yeah, the general narrative is ideology doesn't matter in China. And under Deng Xiaoping, maybe that was correct. You know, you had the famous quote, it doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. And everyone said um, socialism with Chinese characteristics really meant capitalism. That's a very long conversation, but it's, you know, it's about 65% right. Under Xi Jinping, though, he actually is a true believer from all that we can tell. He really believes in Maoist doctrine. And we can see this not only because of what he says about Mao, about his pil pilgrimages to historical sites um, connected with Mao, but also what he's been doing. So for instance, he's taken state enterprises and he's been recombining them back into formal monopolies. 
He's been increasing state subsidies, especially the Made in China 2025 initiative, which is um, industrial policy on steroids. He's been closing off market opportunities for American companies through a number of different ways, not only through what are called um, national security legislation and regulations, but also just um, discriminatory law enforcement actions against American companies. Um, the list just goes on and on. This is basically believing in the state. And that's not Deng Xiaoping. You know, Deng Xiaoping believed in the primacy of the Communist Party in politics. Economics, he was willing to experiment. Xi Jinping, um, you know, he'll talk globalization at Davos as he did this year and as he just did at the APEC uh, forum in uh, Da Nang. But when it comes to what he's actually been doing, China's been moving in all the wrong directions. This is okay for about four or five years, to go back to your point. You can sort of even goose your economy upwards by doing this, by closing off opportunities for foreigners. But long term, they don't bring money into a country where they are being, and I won't use President Trump's word for that, but if you remember in May of last year, he used a word about what China was doing to the United States. That's exactly what they're doing. And American business is actually starting to change its attitudes towards China, which I always have to write down questions because I can never remember them. Um, but it really is the second thing. Um, and that is American business still is trying to prevent the Trump administration from doing what many people would like um, in the administration. But nonetheless, there's a lack of enthusiasm for it, and there's a real concern. So if you talk to the American uh, Chamber of Commerce, they are very concerned about the issue that you raised, the intellectual property theft, and what is the United States going to do? Because they're concerned about the 301. They know that the 301 can royal relations with China. They're, they don't want to have their IP stolen, but they don't want to have China retaliate against them. So you see, you know, um, American business really with an ambivalent attitude these days. Um, and I think that you just long term, American business has become less and less supportive of China, largely because they are being shown the door one way or another. Now, if you're talking about General Motors or General Electric, um, yeah, that's, they're okay. But you talk about Qualcomm. Someone mentioned, you mentioned Qualcomm. Um, we don't have time this morning, I'm sure, to talk about Qualcomm's problems in China and South Korea. But this is a case where you have a flagship American company which is being severely disadvantaged by um, local bureaucracies and the political establishments in both our friend in Seoul and our potential adversaries in Beijing. And this has got to stop. Um, and I think the administration needs... I don't, I don't know about the merits of... Qualcomm's cases in China and in South Korea, but I do know that they have not been getting um, their procedural due rights in South Korea, for instance, and they have been totally slammed in China. And we got to stand up for an American company's procedural rights, if nothing else. I'm David Hunt. Uh, Gordon, are the Russians playing any role in egging the North Koreans on? Um, another really important question, um, and the answer is not much. Um, you know, Putin is a troublemaker, um, at least when it comes to the United States. Um, but he would prefer, and his primary focus, of course, is Ukraine and the Baltics. And you know, increasingly over the last year, we've seen um, problems at home that have preoccupied him, because these problems are severe, including a downturn in the Russian economy that is difficult for him to reverse. Um, that's not to say that Putin won't give us a hard time in um, uh, North Korea because, as I mentioned, he's a troublemaker. He's identified himself very closely with Xi Jinping and will support Chinese initiatives. And that's why Ambassador Haley um, in August or September publicly said, we can get China to move in the right direction, but we're worried about Russia backfilling, which is the word she used. And indeed, that is a problem because when we look at the economic relations between China and North Korea and Russia and North Korea, um, there's been some evidence, not a lot, but there's been some evidence that Russia has indeed been backfilling. In other words, taking advantage of business opportunities that the Chinese 
for various reasons, being pushed by Trump, um, have sort of abandoned. Um, and this is, this is an absolutely critical question for us because of one other thing, and that is there are indications that our, our, our campaign to cut off money to the North Koreans is actually starting to work. There are reports, unconfirmed, but reports nonetheless, that junior officials in Pyongyang, who are part of a favored class, are not getting their rations from the public distribution system. Um, that is consistent with what we have heard that um, um, the regime is asking everybody in North Korea for quote unquote loyalty donations, which is basically taxation, informal taxation. We have heard the regime talk about the sanctions as uh, brutal, quote unquote, and as genocide. So we're getting to them. And so the issue that you raise about Russia's relationship is going to be important because, you know, Trump can spend all of his time working on China and can maybe be successful. But it doesn't really mean anything if the Russians rush right in and do it. One other thing, though, it's good for us, and that is, in addition to Putin's all of his problems at home and all the problems he's got in Europe, the other thing is that he's never really had that much of an affinity for the problems in the Far East. We saw that during the six-party talks during the administration of George W. Bush. Russia was one of the six parties. Russia was not a factor in that. And so that is a real indication that Putin just doesn't really care. So that's the good news. But nonetheless, we always have to be worried about him because he's Putin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really, really.